All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Family Resource Center. My name is Mary Beth Harrison Cunningham. I'm the manager here, and we are so excited to have uh, Ellen Galinsky with us this morning, author of Mind in the Making. Um, Ellen Galinsky is the president of Families and Work Institute, an organization she co-founded in 1989. She is the elected president of the Work and Family Researchers Network, a network of several thousand researchers globally, and additionally serves as a senior advisor to the immediate office of the Assistant Secretary of Youth Mental Health at the Administration for Children and Families, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Between March 2016 and September, September 2022, she served as the Chief Science Officer for the Bezos Family Foundation. Before co-founding the Family and Work Institute, Families and Work Institute, she spent more than two decades at the Bank Street College of Education. Her life's work revolves around identifying important societal questions as they emerge, conducting research to seek answers, and turning the findings into action. She strives to be ahead of the curve, to address compelling issues, and to provide rigorous data that can affect our lives. Over her career, her research has focused on work life, children's development, youth voice, child care, parent professional relationship, and parental development. Galinsky is the author of Mind in the Making, a best selling book on early learning that the New York Times called an iconic parenting manual. And Judy Woodruff of the PBS NewsHour named Must Reading for Everyone Who Cares About America's Fate in the 21st Century. Her book on adolescence, The Breakthrough Years, will be published in March 2024 and involve nine years of research, including three original studies. And I do wanna put a plug in that Ellen will be back with us in May to talk about her new book, The Breakthrough Years. Adam Grant, author of Hidden Potential, says that it smashes common stereotypes of teens and tweens. Dan Siegel, author of The Whole Brain Child, calls it a masterpiece. Mitch Princeton of the American Psychological Association says it is a tour de force. Don't attempt to raise a teenager without reading this book. While Rich Lerner of Tufts University says it's a superb contribution to science and society. He is also the author of 90 books and reports and 360 articles for books, academic journals, magazines, and the web. Other career highlights include serving as the elected president of the National Association for the Education of Young Children, the largest group of early childhood professionals, being elected as the fellow of the National Academy of Human Resources, the highest honor in human resources, and serving as parent expert in the Mr. Rogers Talks with Parent series and receiving a Distinguished Achievement Award from Vassar College as well as the 2022 Lifetime Achievement Award from the Work and Family Researchers Network. In 2023, Women's E! News selected her one of the 2021 20, leaders for the 21st century. Welcome, Ellen Galinsky. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you. And I love that you mentioned Fred Rogers. It would We were very good friends after I appeared on his show, and he would love it that... Um, that people, his work is still so valued among people. It's such a pleasure to be with you virtually on this very rainy day in New York where I am. I hope it's better in Virginia where you are. Um, I'm going to share Mind in the Making um, with you. And um, whoops, let's see if I can do this. Okay. No. Okay, I'm not muted, am I? Am I muted? No, you're fine. Okay, good. Okay, so I always begin with um, this picture of my grandson. This was, uh, he's now going to be 11 this month, but this is <clears throat> a picture of him when I came back from a trip and brought him an airplane. And just the fire in children's eyes is so dramatic. And the question that I had had from a series of studies that I did uh, called Ask the Children Studies was, how do we keep the fire for learning burning in children? In that particular study, uh, uh, studies, I was looking at young people and learning, and I went around the country 
uh, before conducting a study and did focus groups with kids in eight different communities from the fifth through the 12th grade. And if I asked them if they were learning something, they would just sit there, you know, and I'm a pretty good interviewer, you know, I'm used to talking to young people and the, the kids would just sit there, you know, if I asked them when they didn't learn something, they would be all, you know, all over each other to talk about it. Uh, at that point in my own life, my next door neighbors had adopted twin girls from China. And even though they had were eight months old when they came here and they had been in an orphanage and hadn't had the best experiences in life, their eyes were still alive with burning. And I would go from these groups of kids who were older, who were just so not excited about learning to this, these twins next door to say, oh, we've got to do something about this. We've got to keep that fire that children are born with to learn um, alive in their eyes. It's a survival skill for children. Um, and so we, we really need to keep it. So that became my question. Um, at that point, there weren't very many nationally representative studies about how much children were engaged in school, um, in learning in school. But, um, okay, now, why am I doing that? Whoops, okay, let's go forward. Uh, but now we found that too many older kids are not engaged in learning. For example, we did a nationally representative study of nine through 19 year olds. We did it pre-pandemic. And what we found is that 56% of nine through 19 year olds in uh, December of 2019, right before the pandemic started, were, were uh, very engaged in learning or engaged in learning. Uh, were very engaged or engaged in learning. Um, and then the pandemic happened, so we had an opportunity to go back. And what you can see on the bottom row is that only 33% of young people during the pandemic were either engaged or very engaged in learning. And that fits national figures before the pandemic and, and um, afterwards, which is only about 40, 40 to 60% of young people are engaged uh, in learning in school, and that's something that we have to do something about. Uh, I've worked with the business community for years, and if you're not, you know, business leaders used work engagement as a proxy for productivity. If you're not engaged at work, they don't think that you're you're really as um, involved or committed or, or contributing as much as you could be. So they work hard at improving the engagement uh, of, of work of employees and learning. And I think um, we need to do the same in education um, because education matters. Um, there are a number of studies, and this is a book by Jennifer Frederick um, that summarizes this research. Studies find that when young people are engaged, they're more motivated, they have higher grades, they're more likely to stay in school, they're more likely to go to college. And when students are actively engaged, they're also more likely to have positive relationships with other students, less likely to get into trouble or to be depressed. And uh, we know that uh, it's something that I'll talk about a lot when I talk about my next book. We know that the issue of, of uh, depression and anxiety among older kids is, is a serious issue that we have to pay attention to. So engagement is learning uh, is very important in the early years just as it is in the older years. To find out what we can do to keep that fire learning, uh, for learning burning in children's eyes, um, I went out and started to talk to researchers. I wanted to understand early development. I wanted to better. I mean, I've been a child development, um, been involved in child development all my life, but I, I wanted to know the research, to go to the source. And, um, and so I went with a film crew around the country and interviewed and uh, and filmed these the researchers whose names you see on this on this page um, over the years haven't stopped doing it and I didn't want to have them just as talking heads so I'm going to share some of the videos with you this morning I wanted to really find out um, how they know what they know about kids and that came to me from uh, a focus group that I did actually even before I started the book. Um, when I was working with Rob Reiner and a campaign on um, on the um, helping people understand how important the early years are to learning. And uh, we did focus groups um, in that project 
And we did one in Baltimore that I'll never forget. I was behind the two-way window. I wasn't the person doing the focus group, but I was watching. But there was a woman who turned around and she pointed to the window and she said, research. She said, first you tell us to drink red wine and then you tell us not to. And then you say eating red meat is okay. And then you say it's not. I want to know who these researchers are. And I want to know how they know what they know about our children. And I went, yes, that's exactly right. So don't just talk to them. Don't just have them say what they know, but share with you, with me, with or with me to you, uh, how they know what they know about kids. So um, when I went out to look at adolescent development, I did the same thing, interviewed and uh, filmed some of the leading adolescent researchers from around the world. So what did I learn? Um, what do we need to do to promote children's learning and thriving? And I put them together. I don't just focus on learning or just on kids' well-being because I think uh, you have to think of them together. I re always remember Jack Schoenkopf from Harvard saying, if Johnny is sad or mad, he can't add. And that's true. Our emotional well-being, our thriving is very connected uh, to our learning. So what did I learn? Uh, the first thing, one of the first things is there are times when there's a developmental openness to learning and change. And one of those times is in the first few years of, of life when there are trillions of neural connections being made. This is the foundation for learning. Uh, researchers think of this like a house. If you're building a house, this is the foundation for the house. Um, the, the rest of the house is really important, but it sits on a foundation. So it's important to get uh, that right. To, um, to, to really talk about that architecture of the brain, uh, I went to uh, see a researcher named Sam Wang from Princeton. He does um, very uh, behavioral research on synaptic connections, those connections in uh, our brain. And what I loved about interviewing him was um, he talked about being a researcher, but at the time when I talked to him, he also was the father of a six-year-old. And he said that she'd just be doing normal things like eating a banana or fighting with her sister or the things that six-year-olds do. And all of a sudden he'd look at her and he'd say, oh, what is going on in her brain is so amazing. Um, so these early years are very important, but um, it's never too late. Adolescence is also a very critical time when we're sensitive to our environment and when the experiences that we have are more formative than they are in other times, as is the early years. The second thing that I learned um, is that it's all about relationships. We tend to think about all kinds of bells and whistles that we can do to promote learning and thriving, but our mental health, our academic health depends on the relationships we have with people. Uh, a really good example of this, and I'm going to share this video with you, is the still face experiment. Uh, some of you may have seen it before. It's an, it's a, uh, a, uh, an experiment that I love. Um, I'm just right behind the camera uh, when we made this video of uh, Ed Tronic. Um, he's at um, University of Massachusetts at, in Boston, and he developed a very ingenious way of understanding development, which is you, you stop what we normally do and see what happens, and it better helps us uh, understand what is really going on. Just that freeze, you know, that stopping action tells us so much about human development. So let's take a look at, um, at this video. Dr. Edward Tronick of the University of Massachusetts, Boston, has devised a way to show how important social connection is to babies and how much it affects them when a connection with a parent or caregiver is broken. First, Dr. Tronick places six-month-old Mackenzie and her mother face to face. He asks mom to talk and play with her daughter the way she normally does. Hi, sweetheart. <laughs> Obviously, their connection is strong. The baby is engaged, responsive, clearly emotionally content. Then, Dr. Tronic instructs the mother to disengage by making a still face. She stays there, but doesn't respond to her baby. Mackenzie is confused at first. She's not used to mom acting like this. 
Mom turns back, but keeps the still face. Mackenzie expects her to re-engage, but when she doesn't, look how the baby reacts. Even at this young age, she tries to entice Mom to interact with her. She reaches out. She smiles. She flails her hands. All strategies for getting Mom's attention. When that doesn't work, she becomes fussy, emotionally agitated. And finally, she just gives up. The meaning of the event is this emotion that the infant has experienced in relationship to this breaking of the connection in relationship to the mother. And that's a fearful, frightening thing. And the infant will do a lot to try and overcome it. But when they fail, they fail with a sense of helplessness and a loss of control. Dr. Tronic then asks mom to re-engage. It takes a moment, but soon the world goes back to normal for Mackenzie. This striking dynamic happens not just with parents, but with any close caregiver, and at any age. Like with two-year-old Michael and his mother. Mom puts on the still face. And Michael tries everything he can to re-establish connection. When he fails, he falls apart, just like the younger child. Children also have another reaction. Mommy, 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 mommy. Watch when Quincy's mother disengages. Mommy, 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 mommy. He becomes distraught, then more and more insistent, and even physical. But when mom re-engages, the connection is re-established. You did it. You did it. Oh, yeah, I did it. And Quincy goes back to being his normal, happy self. Children are resilient, and breaks in close connection happen all the time in everyday life. What are you doing? What usually then takes place in good relationships is this reconnection that we've seen. And we know now looking at the interaction, that they're only maybe 20, 30 percent of the time is the interaction perfectly, quote unquote, perfectly in sync. The rest of the time is sort of, you know, you're in sync, you're out of sync, you're getting back into sync. And that's really what I think is the key process, which is getting back into synchrony. Dr. Tronic believes that the process of disconnect and reconnect is not only normal, but positive for children of all ages. When you reconnect, one of the things that can happen, not always, but some of the time, is that you create something new. If you create something new, you grow. And babies are about growing. So I think the important thing to remember here is that breaks in close connections happen all the time. This, this uh, experiment is not about to make us feel guilty that we're not perfectly connected all of the time. He says only about 20 to 30 percent of the time are we really in sync. But if we get out of sync with our kids, the repair part, the getting back into sync with them is what's important. That is when growth happens. So growth doesn't happen through the happy ever after moments. It happens often when there are challenges and then we we uh, fix them and uh, and move on. So, uh, but what that video showed me when, when we filmed it, um, it's a classic experiment, um, but it's an older one, but it's still so solid. It showed me that it's all about relationships. I call them the swing vote factor. If you want to know how kids are going to turn out, it's all about the relationships that they have in their lives. That's really what's most important. Um, a second thing that uh, I've learned is that it's not just relationships um, per se, but it's that back and forth interaction. It's it's some people call it serve and return if you're thinking of tennis uh, you could call it um, uh, serve and volley if you're thinking about volleyball 
you could call it um, back and forth. You could, we call it, tend to call it back and forth without a sports analogy, but that is where children learn. Um, in fact, there is um, a wonderful experiment by Pat Cool. I'm not going to show you uh, this particular video, but um, this, this child, her name is Elodie. She's um, 11 months old. And she, if you, if, if the camera pulled back, you'd see that that strap under her neck shows this incredible machine, which is called an MEG machine. It's a machine that, that uh, can take, MEG means that it can take a movie of the brain in action. And Pat Cool from the University of Washington was very interested in how children learn language. And what better way to understand that than to take a movie of their brains, not just to look at their behavior, but to also look at, at their brain. And what they found was perhaps surprising. Um, um, they found that it's the back and forth um, that really promotes um, the development of language. It's not just um, talking at a child, it's giving the child a chance to be active. The brain is built for action. That's really important. And um, the other thing that they found that's particularly important is that it's not just the auditory part of the brain that lights up. They're not just hearing. Uh, the Broca area, which you see in purple in the picture, uh, the Broca area is the part of the brain um, that helps us rehearse what we're going to do. So this child, um, Elodie, was only 11 months old when, when we filmed her, uh, but she was already, and she could about as much as she could say was ma, 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 da, 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 and I heard her do that, so she could say those. But what was happening was she was rehearsing words in her mind so that when she learned to talk later on, uh, obviously when she was older than 11 months old, she was rehearsing what she would need to do. And um, it's like if you've gone to a new place and you think in your mind about what it's going to be like, that's what's happening in the brain before kids learn to talk. That's why talking to children is so important. But it's not just talking to them. It's giving them a chance to talk back and responding to what they do. That back and forth is the foundation for all learning. Um, a third thing that's important we learned is the importance of executive function skills. Um, it's an essential strategy for improving children's learning and thriving. So um, executive function skills, what is that? And, and uh, this is um, an experiment. I'm not going to sh show this one to you, but it explains what executive function is because it shows how, how researchers measure it. That child, he's four years old, um, was given a series of cards. Some had flowers on them and some had stars on them. And, or is it trucks? Let me see what's on the other picture. Uh, move this. Yeah, trucks. Trucks. Oops, trucks on it. And, um, and what, um, what he's given a card, and sometimes the card has a red or blue truck, and sometimes it has a red or blue star. And the researcher will say, or the experimental will say, we're going to play the color game. So if it's blue, it goes in the box that would be on our left. And if it's red, it would be in the box that goes on our right, whether or not it was a truck or um, a star. And then the researcher or the experimental will say, we're going to switch now. We're going to play the shape game. So if it's a truck, it goes in the box that you see on your right. And if it's um, a star, it goes on the left. Now you've asked the child to change what they're doing. So this, this is used as a measure. It's now actually a computer game that, that you can play, a sorting game. But what it does is it measures executive function skills. It measures the fact that kids have to remember the rules, so it uses their working memory. They have to think flexibly because the rules change. They have to reflect. They have to think about whether they're playing the, rule ga the shape game or the color game. And then they have to use self-control because if they've pl been playing one of those games and then you switch to another game from the colored game to the shape game, it's really hard. You want to go on automatic. And so it's resisting the temptation to go on automatic. So that's what executive function skills are. They, um, okay, let's see if I can do this. Yeah, they uh, involve these, these sub-skills. They make it possible to use what you know, which is to keep information in your mind so that you can use it, working memory. 
to think flexibly, to think about alternative perspectives and, and think flexibly in response to changing circumstances called cognitive flexibility in the research, to reflect, to pause, to notice challenges, to step back, to think about what you want to do before you act, and then to use self-control. So you, you don't go on automatic, but you use self-control, inhibitory control, so that you can, you can solve the problem, you can reason, um, and that, so that's what um, executive function skills are. Now I am going to show you an experiment. You may have heard of the marshmallow test by Walter Michel. And it's, an, it's also an experiment that gets at executive function skills. So when you watch it, think about what the kids are doing to be able to delay gratification. The idea of the experiment is that, there are two, that you get a plate with uh, one marshmallow on one side and two marshmallows on the other side. And the experimenter says, OK, uh, I'm going to leave the room. And if you can wait, then you can have two marshmallows. But if you can't wait, ring the bell. And I'll come right back and you can have one marshmallow. So you can see that you have to be able to wait to get more. Um, or if you don't want to wait, then you get less. So let's look at this video. Uh, and, then I, and then I'm going to ask you to, see, uh, to write in the chat what you saw in it. This is a bell, okay? It's called the marshmallow test. We try to set up situations in which young children make a choice between two of something that you prefer later or one of something that you prefer a little less now. If you had to choose, would you like to have one marshmallow yeah. or would you like to have two marshmallows? The whole point of the experiment is to set up an intense conflict between the two. Now here's how we play this game. I'm gonna leave the room while I'm gone. If you can stay here and wait for me to come back without eating the marshmallows, then you get two marshmallows. Okay. But if you don't want to wait, you can make me come back right away the bell. by pressing the bell. But then you get one marshmallow, not two marshmallows. I won't ring the bell. You won't ring the bell? Okay. The conflict for the child is very heavy, is that about half will go one way and half will go the other. Oh, you made me come back! It's like a little window into willpower for dilemmas that everybody faces. What we found is a very simple and direct way of measuring a competence that seems to make an important life difference. The longer they were able to wait at age four, the better the ratings of their ability to control themselves and to pursue their academic and other goals. The kids were able to delay gratification are increasingly learning ways of managing frustration, ways of managing distress. In middle life, there's less drug use, higher educational level attainment, much less likely to have lowered self-esteem, uh, to engage in bullying behavior with other people. The correlations are clearly statistically significant. But that in no way means that a youngster who at age four didn't wait a long time is in any way doomed. I think the important point there is that this is a skill that you learn. And that's why Walter Michel um, says that somebody who can't wait is not in any way doomed. It is a, it is a skill that can be learned. It's very dependent on what's, if they're hungry, if the person is trustworthy, other things. So it's not just something that's inborn in a child. Um, in the chat, I would love you to write down how you saw this, uh, this particular uh, um, experiment getting at the, the components of executive function that I talked about, which were working memory, um, cognitive flexibility, or, or uh, thinking flexibly. 
um, were reflection and self-control. You, can you just write some of what you saw in the chat? And then Mary Beth can, can uh, summarize this. All right, so we've got a few comments. So um, the aspect of impulse control is evident. Um, they utilize a lot of movement, um, self-control, um, working movement, memory. Let me, just, let me yeah. just pause for a minute and say, yeah. Kids don't learn these skills by sitting still in a chair. You can see that they're learning them physically. Go ahead. <laughs> right, absolutely. Um, but working memory, they remembered the rules and what the goal was to wait. Um, and frustration tolerance. Uh, they did whatever they could to not hit the bell, <laughs> uh, which was great. Um, so lots of distraction to kind of pass the time. Um, and it was, I love this one. So that you saw the uniqueness of each child and how they handled that frustration and waiting. Um, also lots of processing, the processing of what was going on. Um, so, and one, and one of our um, participants said, love the kid that tried to lick the marshmallow. So <laughs> it was great. Have it both um, ways. <laughs> right, right. Um, and self-talk to maybe ease the difficulty. Uh, yeah. So there you go. Shaking their heads, self-talk, walking away and not even seeing it. In fact, there have been lots of studies. I'll share this when I talk about my book on teenagers when I come back in May. But there have been lots of studies about how we learn self-control. And you can see it all visibly in these kids and how they manage to wait for those two marshmallows. You know, distraction, self-talk, um, changing the situation, like moving away so they don't see it. That's great. Thank you. So um, why do we care about executive function skills? Well, these are papers that uh, Adele Diamond and Daphne Ling from the um, one of the papers, the paper on the left, is a paper that D uh, Adele Diamond and Daphne Ling wrote where they summarize the results of, uh, of uh, many, many, many experiments uh, that measured executive function. And they found that they're predictive of achievement, health, wealth, and quality of life. And they're actually more important to uh, success than um, that than uh, school readiness than IQ or entry level reading or math. So they're very important. The study on the right is one that I've always loved uh, because um, this is a study of a thousand kids who were born in Dunedin, New Zealand, a place that I've actually been been to. And in this particular um, study, they followed these kids from uh, birth through 32 years of age, and they did hundreds and hundreds of, of um, you know, experiment, you know, studies looking at, uh, at, at what was going to predict their life success. And they found that self-control, uh, the kids who were good at self-control at four years old, um, were healthier and wealthier when they were 32 years old. It was um, a very strong prediction, which is one of the things that led researchers to really focus on the importance of, of, these, of these skills. Um, uh, other, another paper of Daphne Ling and, and Adele Diamond, and uh, still another paper that, that showed that kids who were good at uh, persisting when there were problems, and you talked about the persistence in the chat, um, did much better. They were much more likely to go to college. These are skills that can be taught though. This is not inborn. This is something that we can all learn. But again, the summary of the research shows that they're predictive of success throughout school, from preschool through college or university, often more so than IQ. And they're crucial for life success, like getting and keeping a job, or making and keeping friends, or even losing weight, or um, adults with better exec executive function skills. Uh, report that they're happier and have a better quality of life. So these skills are important to both school and life success. Um, and they're the skills that employers are looking for. I told you that I do research with employers and, and um, I've done a, had done a nationally representative study of the U.S. workforce for years. And if I wanted to, uh, you know, get uh, 
employer is angry at a cocktail party, I would just say, so tell me about the new entrance to the workforce. And they would say, they don't have the skills that they need. Um, they, they just know how to answer multiple choice questions or they don't know how to work in teams or um, they can't really communicate well or they're not good problem solvers. And so I feel very strongly and I'm working with schools all over the country. I'm going to be working very closely with the school superintendent organization, AASA, to help make sure that we promote these skills um, beginning in early childhood. So now a, a time to go back to the chat. Think of a time when you were in a challenging situation and you used a skill to deal with it successfully and just write briefly about what that skill was in the chat and why it was important to you. And then Mary Beth, if you could share those. Absolutely. Any, anybody have a time when you had a challenging situation and, and used skills to deal successfully with that? I know people might still be typing because it's probably a little bit longer. Yeah. Um, so. All right. Don't see anything yet. Let's wait. Ah, here we go. Conflict with the supervisor. Uh, communication skills were essential, both written and spoken. Yes. Yep. Taking a step back, deep, calm breath, clarifying others' opinions before responding. Yeah. Um, so uh, basically everyday life. But COVID is a great example of how we all coped with uncertainty and anxiety. Absolutely. Yeah, not for sure. All right. Uh, parenting, yes. <laughs> especially with young children. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Um, re just doing research. Um, every day as a parent, when I stop, listen, reflect back what I hear, it goes better. When I react first, it goes poorly. That is such a perfect example of executive function skill. That is right. a perfect example. I'm going to move on. That's yep. um, what I found was that there are these skills that build on those core components. We talked about working memory. We talked about thinking flexibly. We talked about um, uh, reflection and we talked about using self-control and those four components fit into these uh, life skills, these skills that we use every day. You were talking about communication. You were talking about focus and self-control when you uh, reflect rather than react right away. Um, you talked, we, you wrote about COVID and that certainly was a time when we had to take on a challenge. So let me talk about, and these are life skills, life and learning skills that, that build on executive function. So, um, this is, I'm just going to give you a brief research example of, of each of these skills. Um, one of them is focus and self-control. This is Megan McClellan. She's the one I just told you about who did a study that showed that kids who had attention span persistence were much more likely to go to college if they had learned to wait when, and pay attention to something and, and really be able to focus on it. They were more like almost 50% more likely to go to college. Uh, years later, and this, she hadn't intended to look at that. She was looking at twins who were raised separately and what made the difference um, in their lives and came, found these skills. And then it changed her life because she began to study them. So she developed ways to, uh, to measure um, focus and self-control. This is, um, and she does them for schools in what's called circle time game. So this is a game, like Simon says, and in Megan's game, it's if the experimenter says, touch your head, you touch your head. If the experimenter says, touch your toes, you touch your toes. If the experimenter says, touch your shoulders, you touch your shoulders. Experimenter says, touch your knees, you touch your knees. It's not the same as Simon says, but it's built on it. Then the experiment says, I'm going to get a little tricky here. Uh, if I say, touch your head, you're, you're to do the opposite and touch your toes. So she's going to demonstrate touching your head. The kids are going to see her do that. So it's really easy to just copy her, but she wants them to touch their toes. 
And that little measure that she used, you know, based on Simon Says, was predictive of which kids did better in reading and math um, from um, in the bridge to uh, uh, from uh, four year olds to five year olds into kindergarten and even into first grade. We've used games like Simon Says forever to promote uh, to promote and, and they turn out to promote these skills. Can you think of other games? Just write them in the chat if you can think of some other games that we've used forever that that promote this skill of focus and self control. All right, Beth, can you think of a game while people are writing? Yeah, so hide and seek, freeze hide. dance. Yes. Yeah, Twister, uh, mm -hmm. Red Rover, mm -hmm. Musical Chairs. Mm -hmm. yep. yep, Red Light, Green Light. Exactly. <laughs> right. So I think that's one of the reasons when I understood this research, I think it's one of the reasons that these games have lasted throughout history. I mean, they really are teaching us something important. We don't need games to teach it. We can teach it in everyday ways. But, um, you know, if you're if you're in the car with your kids and they're driving you crazy, you can think of a game where they have to use these skills. These are what Megan has done is figure out ways that we can uh, use everyday moments to promote these skills. Um, and um, perspective taking is an, another important skill. This is um, um, this is research by Allison Gopnik, and she gave kids a box of crayons and uh, what looked like a box of crayons, and it was all closed up. This is four year olds. And it was all closed up and she said to the kids, what do you think is inside? And he'd say, well, crayons, you know, um, look, it's crayons are inside. And then uh, she would open it up and she would show the kids, no, they're not crayons inside, they're paper clips. And then she would say to the children, so what do you think your friend over there will think if he sees this box all closed up? Do you think he'll think that they're paper clips inside or do you think he'll think that they're crayons? And some kids say crayons because there's a picture of crayons on uh, the box. And some kids will say paper clips because they now know that they're paper clips and they think that now everyone will know it. And that's perspective taking, being able to understand that someone else might not know what you know, what not might not feel what you feel. Uh, that is the skill of perspective taking. And study after study find that perspective taking is critical to being able to deal with that supervisor that you wrote about who might be giving you a hard time. Why do you think maybe the supervisor was having a hard day? You know, why do you think that was happening? So this is a skill that is important in everyday life, but it's also important in, in, in work. Um, I always think of the iPhone, you know, who knew we needed an iPhone before we actually uh, got it? But people who think of new inventions um, in society are able to take the perspective of customers. It is uh, the most important skill in business is to be able to understand what your coworkers, what your customers uh, think and feel. A good example was Marriott when they took the perspective of people who would stay in their hotels and realize that they would really like to have an iron in the rooms. They put irons in something so simple as irons in the hotel rooms and it increased um, the people who came to a Marriott. Now everybody does it, so it's not a differentiating, differentiating factor anymore, but it just shows you how important this skill of perspective taking is. Um, you talked about communicating, and communicating is another uh, really important skill. Communicating is not literacy, it's understanding that um, what it is you want to say and then understanding how it will be heard. And in this particular experiment, um, uh, Kathy hirsch Pasick, Roberta Golenkoff, and Lauren Anderson went back and looked at the kids who were really good at communicating, um, looked at, because they've been doing, following a bunch of kids for years, uh, looked at three-year-olds and looked at what was going on when they were two that helped them learn this skill, and found that it was that back and forth that we were talking about with Patricia Cool's research that going back and forth, that serve and return, that was really important. When the adults stopped and asked kids how they think and feel and going back and forth, um, I'm going to give a speech on my new book to my grandson's school. And he called me last night. <clears throat> he wanted to talk about what I was gonna say. And he said to me, because they have assemblies, these 
now in the upper school of his school. Um, and he said, um, so he was talking about my coming and that I should come Wednesday morning. And he told me about what the other speakers who had written books came and said to the kids. And he said to me, what is the main point you want people to know from giving your speech? What do you hope the kids learn from your being there? And I went, whoa, <laughs> that's the skill of communicating. That is so fabulous. He's asking me, what do I want to communicate? What do I hope people will learn? Hopefully I then won't be all over the place. Um, the next skill that's important is making connections and that underlies cause and effect. Um, this is a particular experiment um, also by Alison Gopnik. She's at uh, University of California at Berkeley and she created a box called the Blinkett Detector. And uh, they're just a bunch of blocks that you put on it. And the, the experimenters, you can see her sitting on the right, has like a switch on her foot that she can just make the box light up. And there's the light, you can see it on it. And she'll put a pattern of blocks, like two squares on, a, on there, um, or a square, a circle and a square. And sometimes it'll light up and it, sometimes it won't. And the idea is to figure out what's a blanket. This box will light up if there's a blanket. And the kids, the, the experiment for the kids is to figure out what a blanket is. And that skill of making connections, she's looking at how kids understand what causes what, the kind of thinking that they go to. If you think about it, though, cause and effect or understanding uh, how things stand for one another, how things go together, is underlies all of our knowledge. Just take my glasses. Um, if you see them, they're glasses. But then if you look at the word G-L-A-S-S-E-S, -S -S -E -S, that's the stand for relationship. The, that word stands for this real thing. Or you think about numeracy. You have a bunch of uh, three blocks you see in the picture. If you saw the uh, number three, the written out uh, numeric uh, symbol for, the, for a three, that's the stand for relationship. So all of our knowledge is based on that stand for relationship and that's a skill making connections that underlies all of those skills. The next skill is critical thinking, which is understanding what's real and what's valid. And this is an experiment that was done at MIT um, by Laura Schultz. Um, it's also an experiment that I like. She made this jack-in-the-box kind of toy. You can see that it's really homemade. Um, and there are two of them. One is yellow and one is red. And it's got a duck and a pig in it. And it's got levers on it. And um, and if you push two levers, you have to figure out which one makes the duck or which one makes the pig go up, or does just one lever work for, for all of them. And um, what she found is that if you show kids how it works, that is, you tell them too quickly how it works, they get really, they want to move on and look at, play with the yellow, um, the yellow jack in the box. Uh, they're not interested in it. But if you don't show them, they'll really pursue it to figure out how it works and what's real and what's valid in knowledge. And, um, and so answering kids' questions too quickly um, rather than helping them figure out what's true, what's valid. And I think in a world where knowledge, you can Google for knowledge, but you're not really sure what to believe, critical thinking is, is in fact, so critical. I, I think of an example from my own life um, when, our, when our Zay was um, sick one time, and of course it was the 4th of July and there were no doctors on call, you know, and... Uh, he was he had a 104 fever and was throwing up and and my daughter gave him some Advil and he threw it up and then she didn't know what to do next had he gotten it hadn't he gotten it should she give him more Advil was she overdosing him should she then switch to to liquid Tylenol you know here's a kid with a really bad fever no doctor calling back she googles and she finds like five different answers and what's real what's valid so we have to be really good at figuring out in our everyday life. Uh, what knowledge to trust and what not to trust. And that's the skill of critical thinking. The next skill is taking on challenges. And um, I have this video that I'm going to show you for this one. Uh, taking on challenges means not just that we're resilient when uh, tough things happen, when things are challenging, uh, but that we can take on the next hard thing. And I'm going to show you this film and, and see what you think of it.
suspect that it has something to do with psychological distancing. So uh, the symbol or the pretense situation is something that puts some space, uh, in some cases, literally some distance, physical distance, between you and uh, the problem at hand or the temptation um, that you're trying to resist. That space allows for one to get a broader perspective on the situation and realize that they that, that you have a choice in how to respond um, versus tunnel vision, a knee-jerk reaction of just going for the first thing that comes to mind. We've tried this as a frustrating uh, task. So um, where children are um, emotionally engaged. I have two really awesome toys. I have a doll and a car. Which one do you want to play with today? The car? We can't play with it right away, but we're going to play with it in a little bit. But I want to make sure that it stays safe, okay? So we're going to put it in this box so that you can play with it later, all right? They really want it, but they have to use a set of keys in order to open this box to retrieve the toy. The trick is that none of the keys works on this large key ring. And we're looking to see how long children persist at trying to get inside the box, how many keys they try, how long they try with the keys. In this experimental context, we impose this instruction to think about yourself, um, either your own thoughts and feelings, think about yourself in the third person, um, and or to think about yourself as being somebody uh, who has good self-control, good emotional control. Which one of these characters do you want to pretend to be while you're working? Okay, so to help you pretend, I have this cape here that you get to wear. And so when you get frustrated, I just want you to ask yourself, how is Batman feeling? Can you say that now? Can you say, how is Batman feeling? How yeah. is Batman feeling? Yeah, yeah. So while you're working on this, if you get frustrated, just ask yourself, how is Batman feeling? Children who have the suggestion, this mindset to think about themselves uh, from a more distant perspective, see the situation in a different light and are able to regulate their emotions in this very frustrating task and uh, persist longer at the task. We see that when we uh, have this simple suggestion to um, pretend to be Batman, for example, children uh, of age five perform as if they are six years of age, um, whereas their counterparts who are not encouraged uh, in the same way to think about themselves uh, as a different person uh, with good self-control perform much like their other um, age peers. So it's really a 12-month advantage that we're seeing um, with this simple suggestion. By helping children uh, achieve the psychological distance from the situation, from the problem that they need, it allows them to engage in that reflection. Um, so the distance provides the window of opportunity for reflection to come in and take hold. So taking on challenges, uh, being able to separate yourself, to step back, helps you handle something that's different. And that's what happens when kids play. People um, always think that play is one thing and work is another, but play is the, uh, one way of rehearsing or figuring out how you would deal with a difficult situation. So it's, it's really uh, such, such an incredible part of learning um, in this, for this child. Okay. Um, and the final skill is self-directed engaged learning, which is being able to set goals for yourself and stay engaged in keeping them. So I wanted to share, before we have questions and answers, some of the resources that we've created uh, from this work with Mind in the Making. Um, we have modules that uh, we've done in Fairfax County for years. Mary Beth tells me you're about to start them up again, and that's very exciting. These, this, these go into a lot more depth about executive function skills and how you can promote them and brings together both educators and community leaders. It begins with adults and how you can develop the skill in yourself. It shares the kind of research videos that I've shared with you on child development, promotes life skills, um, and we've had more than 100,000 people um, in the country. And this coming year, we're releasing um, asynchronous online modules for those of you who are interested in those. We've also created, we've selected 89 
books that promote these skills. Remember, there are everyday ways that you can promote them. We did this work with First Book, um, and we created tip sheets um, that talk about how you can read these books in ways that promote life skills. And um, we these have been downloaded um, more than uh, 1.5 million times. And um, First Book has distributed more than 2 million books at greatly reduced prices for programs serving low-income kids. Um, and so uh, this is, um, oops. Uh, here you go, and, and Mary Beth sent me this picture of your library, and on each of the shelves are the books that we picked for focus and self-control, for perspective taking, uh, for taking, uh, for um, communicating, for making connections, for, for um, critical thinking and taking on challenges, and self-directed engaged learning. So there's a resource for you um, in the library of books and then tips for how to read them in ways that promote skills. Um, Mississippi made videos that go along with each of these skills um, and made them for, uh, it was their PBS station that made animated videos that are very cute. Uh, you can see the marshmallow in all of the videos um, and they share them with, um, with families across the country and I'm sure we could find ways for them to share them with you. Um, we also at the Bezos Family Foundation created something called Vroom which are a thousand tips uh, that we wrote that take everyday moments, bath time, bedtime, um, brushing to get out of the house in the morning, everyday things that you do, standing uh, in the, in the uh, checkout line in the market, everyday things that you do that promote, um, that promote these skills. And uh, they're now used by 2 million people in 80 countries. You can get them in cards, you can get them online, and you can get them by text. Um, we work with Mount Sinai Hospital to take this information and share it with pediatricians so that when parents go to pediatricians and they have a parenting question, pediatricians will learn the research. They, they typically learn medical research, but not information about child development. So we now, uh, this, these modules that we've created are now used in 86% of all teaching residency programs for pediatricians in the United States. You can see all those dots on the map. Um, and then we created decals to put on the wall. So uh, when, when my son goes to Mount Sinai, which is where his pediatrician is, um, you see these on the walls. Did you know? Have you tried? It's science um, that we created. Um, and then um, we've also found that autonomy support, which is not fixing it for kids, but having kids learn to solve problems for themselves in ways that promote skills, is critical to executive function skills. This is research that Stephanie Carlson also did that shows that when parents, uh, the kids were given a puzzle that was just a little bit too difficult for them to do. And when parents helped kids learn how to solve the puzzle for themselves rather than jumping in and doing it for them or standing back and doing nothing, the kids had better executive function skills. So what we've done is we've turned that with, um, we've turned that into um, tip sheets, um, which involve these four, these four aspects, which is uh, check in on yourself. Why are you reacting? Like if your child is driving you crazy, why are you reacting as you do? And then try to understand what your child is going through. Why does your child uh, behaving this way? What, what are their goals? What can and can't they do developmentally? And then share the reasons of why you want your child to do something. And then problem solve together rather than fixing it for the child. Help, you, help the child learn to solve it for themselves. So we developed all of these tip sheets that are available online for you uh, that help you turn everyday challenging moments into skill building moments. So now we have time for your questions and um, I will get off screen and um, stop sharing my screen. All right. And uh, here, here we can add, have time yeah. for any questions or comments or things you Absolutely. want. Absolutely. All right, just going back in the chat, I noticed a couple of questions earlier. All right. So someone actually made a comment about that um, perhaps a lot of what, or some of the things that you're talking about, Ellen, it sounds like emotional intelligence. Yeah. 
did, did anyone ever read the book Emotional Intelligence? If you did, mm -hmm. uh, it's written by a man named Dan Goldman. And Dan Goldman is actually a neighbor of mine. And I was out for a walk yesterday with my dogs and I saw him. He will be so happy when I see him <laughs> to know that the, the concept that he brought forward uh, is something that you all said in, in this talk. I'm, I can't wait to tell him. Um, yes, it is a lot like emotional intelligence. It brings together what Dan did. I think that's important is that he understood that it's not just cognition versus um, emotion or social intelligence. He brought those all together and executive function skills bring together our social, our emotional and our cognitive capacities so that we can solve problems. And um, if you think about it, we often talk about social emotional learning and then academic learning as if they were separate. But when I was talking about Jack Shonkoff saying, if Johnny is sad or mad, he can't add, or we could say mm -hmm. Betty, same thing or whatever name you want. Um, and uh, we need to understand that all of these things go together in the children. The way that the brain works is that our social, our emotional, our, and our cognitive capacities go together for us to be able to solve a problem, to think critically, to communicate, to take on challenges. You're exactly Absolutely. right. Absolutely. Well, and I will say that Fairfax County Public Schools um, has invested quite a bit of resources and opportunities for students around social emotional learning and how we add that component into their academic day. Um, so, you know, realizing that those can't be separate things, but they really do need to go together in order for children to learn. Um, so we have one question, how might executive functioning skills impact or be different uh, for a child who maybe has experienced trauma? Um, executive function skills are critical in, in the recovery from trauma. So, um, they're particularly important in helping kids, um, recover, heal from trauma. Um, I, I've, some of the research that I've really loved is where they have done, um, studies that looked at kids who have experienced trauma and found that if they also had good experiences, good relationships with other people, that, that the trauma didn't have that kind of effect. So that could be a grandmother, a, a father, a mother, an aunt, a cousin, a teacher, a librarian, just a, an important relationship in that child's life um, is, is the basis for recovering from, uh, from trauma, number one. And then number two, if in everyday life, the person who is that important relationship can help the kids um, build these skills in everyday ways, in everyday moments, it shouldn't be just another to do. It should be just thinking about how you can help, not fixing things for kids, but helping kids begin to learn to fix them for themselves as they can. Um, then your child is on, on the road to recovery. I also think that we need to take an asset approach to trauma, not just a trauma, trauma approach to trauma. And by that, I mean that the best programs, I took a look at some of the best programs that help families who have experienced tr trauma in their lives. And they start with what you're already doing well. So an example is a program um, called ABC Vitamins in California. And when they work with parents, they start with what do you love about your child? And then they build on that love to help the family gain better coping skills for when things are difficult. Um, another program is called FIND. This is, was developed by Phil Fisher, who was at Oregon, University of Oregon, when he developed it. He's gone to Stanford. And what they do is they video parents and kids in interactions together. And rather than pointing out what the parents are doing wrong, they find those moments when the parent is um, connecting in a positive way, what we saw in the kind of the positive connection with the Ed, with the Edtronic experiment. And they play those back for the parent and say, build on those, do more of those. And that helps families uh, build on the strengths that they already had and help promote those strengths in kids. A third thing I feel about trauma is that it's important to not assume if you're a teacher, for example, a librarian or someone working with kids who have had trauma, to understand that they're more than the worst thing that's happened to them in their lives. Um, and, and so to see them again through their strengths, through their assets. In fact, some states have moved away from the notion of trauma-informed care to think about 
asset informed care or wellness or strengths based care. So it, we need not to put kids in a box who have had trauma, but understand that life, that growth and change and resilience is always possible. Um, a lot of studies that I looked at during the teenage years show how that, how when we as parents or we as teachers can learn those skills during adolescence uh, that children can can recover from having been in an orphanage that was very depriving in their early years or can recover from serious um, trauma, uh, racism or violence or other experience that they may have had. So it, every day is a new day in parenting. Yeah, absolutely. So speaking of your your upcoming book, there is a, a family member here that's asking just some some uh, advice around a 19 year old child who has who is part of the autism spectrum has attention deficit disorder and anxiety um, issues, but he but they want to go to college, struggles with executive functioning skills, and wants to be like the average teen. Any perhaps some initial advice for for our families like that? That's so wonderful. I mean, I I think that the most important thing that we can have in life. That's why self-directed engaged learning is the final goal that pulls everything together. If you can help um, that that child see what they need to do to achieve their goal to go to college, and it may not be everything at once, particularly um, um, for kids who have uh, challenges. So it may not be fixing everything at once, uh, mm -hmm. but taking one thing that the that this child can do uh, to work on so that they can go to college. That's number one. But number two, I think is, um, I'm, I'm hoping that we will increasingly live in a world that understands neurodiversity, that understands that, that there's no such thing as the typical teenager. Uh, in fact, I, in my study of teenagers, I asked them, what what should the adults of America know about people your age? And they were like, don't stereotype us, don't label us. Um, yep. And so we Great. we need to have everyone understand that there's a range of abilities. Uh, I was talking to a program last night where they have mixed age groups and that works really well because nobody thinks there's a tap, typical three-year-old and a typical four-year-old. You understand that within three-year-olds and within four-year-olds, you're gonna have a whole range of development and that's what's normal. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, uh, another parent is asking around, could you give us some more examples on how to make psychological distance for promoting teens and preteens? Yes. Learning? Yeah, there's wonderful research that a, a man named Ethan Kroos did and um, he, he got really interested in what we can do to help kids deal with challenges. And he found something, I think it was listening to Le LeBron James that, that gave him his aha moment. You never know where, as a researcher, your aha moment is gonna come from, that this was listening to LeBron James. And he started to talk about himself in the third person. What would LeBron do if this, you know, he was in an interview and he went, ah, you know, and he found that he tested it then. So he gave kids what's called the, the Greer uh, social stressor test. In that test, uh, kids have to, they, they have, they're told that they're about to give a speech. It like puts kids under, um, you know, it's not harmful, but you know, under stress. Under stress. So the, the, in the experiment, the kids come into a lab and they're told that they're, that they're going to have to, they're going to have to make a speech and they're going to make it in front of a bunch of kids who are going to judge them. And, um, and they can prepare, but they can't take any notes. And then when they're giving the speech, they have to, um, if they, if they start over, you know, that they, you know, explain more about that. No one smiles. It's like the, it's like, uh, Edtronics still face. Everybody's just staring at you. No one's giving you encouragement, nodding and smiling and the things that we do to give each other support. And then they're, then they're told to do mental arith arithmetic, like start it at 799 and start subtracting by 13 or, you know, something like that, start, or start at 800 and start subtracting by 13. And if they make a mistake, they say, start over, you know, no, no verbal and so it's a, and what they're doing is they're measuring their cortisol level, which is the stress hormone. And what they found is that kids who prepare for their speech by 
doing what that little boy was doing in Stephanie Carlson's research, which was, um, in this case, they were told to think of what would Ellen do in that situation, not what I do, but what would Ellen do in that situation before they get into that situation, that they actually don't get as stressed, their cortisol level doesn't go as high. And they also found that using you, thinking of yourself in the third person, or the second person rather than in the first person, just that simple way of putting a distance between you and the situation um, is um, that the brain doesn't have to work so hard to deal with a challenging situation. Um, so that's one technique. Uh, thinking, having, helping kids say, what would you do? The second technique we saw in Stephanie Carlson's research, which is um, thinking of, of um, yourself in pretend person. Um, have you ever watched kids play, you know, some sort of um, good guy, bad guy kind of, you know, uh, preschoolers play good guy, bad guy. So the kid who can't sit still, but if that kid is playing the cop, that kid can be very still and really manage. So pretending, giving kids a chance to play and pretend, little kids, is a hugely important way of, of uh, creating psychological distance and helping kids manage. Um, another technique, this is done by, uh, by Jeffany, uh, by, I'm sorry, Jennifer Silvers at UCLA, and her technique was take a near and far perspective. So you ask kids to, um, whatever the challenging situation is, to look at it from a far perspective, like you're a fly on the wall, or you probably heard go to the balcony, um, those sorts of things. So just step back and look at it. And, you know, without even knowing this technique, I used to do this in the grocery store with, with my kids when, if they were gonna have a, you know, flip out it, I want that candy that's at the checkout counter. Of course, they put the candy at the checkout counter. Right. My parents crazy, right? right. Yeah. Yeah, they're hungry. They've been yeah. looking at food. Um, and um, I would just pretend that I was in a movie. Um, and that way, that gave me the ability to step back, to pause. You know, I'm in a movie. I'm not This isn't my real life. This is just a movie. I'm, you know, they're filming me in this. In, you know, there's a candid camera in there filming me. And then I would react much better. I wouldn't flip out and back right out at my kids. So um, that, yeah. that sort of uh, technique also works well. No, thank you. Uh, so um, another question just around a child who maybe um, is really trying to adjust to new classroom experience um, as a result of the pandemic, you know, they weren't in a classroom for perhaps amount of time and they're exhibiting attention seeking behaviors. Um, are there any specific skills, you know, the ones that, of course that you have mentioned that that might be helpful in, in, in helping that child adapt? To, um, that experience in the classroom. Um, keep keep trying it, um, and so when I, behavior is always a communication. So if a child is seeking attention, that child needs attention. That's not a bad thing. So finding ways, if you're the teacher or the parent, to give the child the attention that they need, but also help them look at one thing that they did that helped them manage it. So you make those strategies verbal. You make them, if, if you name it, you, you can tame it. Uh, if you make the strategies that they're using uh, uh, visible, verbal, uh, so that they can understand it, that will help them cope. And then if you can tell them stories about other children too, so you normalize it. You say, yeah, pretty much everyone who goes to a new situation has trouble. Um, it takes us a while to learn to go to someplace new, all of us. And here, here's what I heard that so-and-so, some kid did, you know, you can make it up. Or you can go to the library. Here we have um, Mary Beth and representing mm -hmm. libraries. Um, I, when my kids were having trouble with things like that, I would go to the librarian and I'd say, please give me a book to read about a child who had a trouble with whatever my child was having trouble with. And we would read that book and we would talk about that child as a third person, not, you know, well, Laura, you're having this trouble, or Philip, you're having this trouble. We would talk about it, oh, well, in this book, Betsy is having these troubles. And that really helped them gain tools, gain strategies to cope with something, but not feel bad about it because they could see that it was normal and that everyone was learning it and these are skills to be learned. No, absolutely. And and I will put a plug in for our library here at the Family Resource Center. We have a whole children's library. Uh, and so we have many books like 
um, Ellen is describing um, and be happy, happy to share those with you. Um, this you is a shout out, love. <laughs> <laughs> um, so is critical thinking a skill that is taught or something people develop as they grow and have access to different information and knowledge? All of these skills have to be promoted. These are skills that emerge developmentally. In the early years, we're forming those connections in the brain. And so they're just, the skills are just being developed. But in the teenage years, they're getting stronger. And the ones that we use are the ones, you know, use it or lose it. The ones that we use remain and the ones that we don't use begin to fall away. That's the normal process of brain development. So, no, I, I think that one of the problems with education um, today and why I'm working with AAS8, um, the school superintendent organization, is we need to find ways to promote these skills for parents and teachers and everyone who's in a child's life, grandparents, you know, aunts and uncles, whomever, to promote these skills. And just, first of all, being aware of them. So, you know, my goal for my work is that you, you know, you think of these skills as a new pair of glasses and you just see in everyday moments the opportunities to promote them. That's why we wrote those thousand tips for Vroom. Um, you know, yeah. My yeah. grandson would come for the weekend and I would, you know, have 10 more tips. Uh, after the weekend, I got really good at it because I was looking at the opportunities in everyday life to promote these skills. And that's what I hope you all do. You just, you know, next time you have a moment with a child, think about how am I going to promote critical thinking? So if a child comes to you with something that's implausible rather than saying, no, that's, you know, that's stupid, that's not real, um, which is our tendency, all of us, is to say, well, let's figure out, is it real or isn't it real? And, and help your child become a detective, help your child become a scientist, uh, help your child explore and figure out the right answer. And that's the way we, we um, develop critical thinking. And then you can ask the question, this is a question that researchers ask to promote this skill. How do you know that that's real? How do you know that that's valid? And help the child figure out what are the tools of their mind? What are the skills that they're using? Again, if you can name it, you can tame it, you can use it. Right. Absolutely. Um, so the mom is talking about her two-year-old toddler and wanted to know, are of, of the seven essential uh, life skills, um, executive functioning skills, which ones might she want to work on first? Is Would there be an order? Uh, would there, do some rise to the top? And she's just, she said as a working parent, she has some limited time. So what should she go after maybe to start? Well, I think using everyday moments uh, to promote these skills. So um, your child throws um, something off of the high chair. You know, they throw their food, their spoon on the floor. And um, you can say, whoa, you've done an experiment. Um, does it always drop that fast? And you could yeah. say, let's drop, keep dropping the spoons. It's just taking those everyday moments, peekaboo, you know is a great way to develop this skill. Um, you know, where have I gone? Here I am, where have I gone? Here I am. So they're, they're all of those things that, again, we've done for centuries uh, really matter. Simon says, um, not with two-year-olds, because they can't do, they can't, they're not able to do the Simon says part, but you can say, touch your head, touch your toes, touch your head. You know, they're following directions, they're paying attention. Um, building on what they say and extending it. So uh, I think that's probably the most important thing you can do. No, that's great. Thank you for that. Um, so any suggestions about um, how we encourage children to voice disapproval and not being concerned about upsetting others? Um, you know, perhaps having that child put themselves first for self-care more at the forefront. I'm not quite sure. Can you say a little bit more about that? I know it's a written question about that, but how no, are you? No, sure. But I think the way I'm kind of interpreting it is, I, is you know, oftentimes, you know, children have a, do have a struggle with a hard time voicing disapproval or something that they may not want to do. And um, how might we encourage a child to be able to um, have that voice? and be able to, to perhaps give their opinion um, without thinking that they might upset others and um, but want to put their needs out there. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Well, children who are listened to will listen to others. 
Mm -hmm. So the first thing we can do is just listen to children and not say you're right or you're wrong or judge them. Um, the research of Carol Dweck, I think, is really important here. What Carol found is that the way that we praise children makes a big difference. If we praise children for their personalities, for something that is seemingly inborn, you're so smart, you're so kind, you're so generous, you're so this, um, that they're more likely to worry that they won't keep that attribution. No, they won't think I'm smart if I do this. And so they're less likely to want to say something that might be a mistake. So praising uh, effort and praising strategy have been much more important. You really tried hard at that, or you did something that was very, rather than you are smart, you did something uh, that was really smart because you did this, this, and this. So if you can think about praise in a different way, um, it's often kids who, who feel that they're going to be judged because they've been praised and because we were well-meaning in praising them, but a worry that they won't keep that attribution. Um, that's another thing that you can do to help them get out there. And if they do just a little bit of it, acknowledge it. You did that. I know that was hard and you, you did that. I think that helps build, you know, we, we do more of what people, of, of, of um, if we know that people like what we've done. Absolutely. Um, and I apologize, I had missed this question. Um, so uh, how do we get buy-in from a bright 12-year-old boy who has a lot of these executive functioning skills that you've talked about, but uses them in a creative way that maybe is not for the greater good? <laughs> uh, um, does that fit into one of these seven or is there an eighth skill that is for the greater good? Well, in... in um... I, I think that that's, let's take perspective taking. Yeah. Uh, bullies are really good at perspective taking. You can know how to drive someone crazy by figuring out what their weaknesses are. You, you, you understand them. You can, you can needle them where it hurts. And uh, so that's an example of using a skill not for the greater good. I think that the purpose of all of the skills is, um, is to, to make the world a better place, to contribute. I think that that is something that we all want to do. So building on how we can all contribute um, is one way that we can do that, to use it for the greater good. So you're good at that. Uh, you're really good at understanding how other people think and feel. Now, how can you do that? And some of the more effective, let's take bullying, some of the more effective interventions have been where they have the kids come up with inter interventions. So you make it part of the kid culture, like right. let's do an anti let's do an anti-bullying um, intervention in our classroom, you know, taking that time to, or let's teach the younger kids about bullying. So you take that time to, to acknowledge and reinforce the social good, the, 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 the thing that you want. So, yeah, I think all of the skills, uh, and I say this in the last chapter of Mind in the Making, all of the skills have to be for the greater good. You can use all these skills for good or for evil. <laughs> and uh, we want we want children to grow up and use them to make the world a better place. I know I do. Absolutely. Um, and I did want to let everyone know that we do have many copies of Ellen's Mind in the Making book in our library. Um, again, and as Ellen showed you the picture, we have um, all of those books um, available and tip sheets available. So um, really do reach out to us if you'd like additional resources. But I think we have come to the end of our questions. So Ellen, thank you so very much uh, for this. This has been fantastic. Um, I know our family's got a lot um, of wonderful information today and we um, can't wait to see you again in May and uh, are looking forward to, to that as well and want to thank everyone for joining us today and please have a wonderful weekend. Take so care. I, yeah, I would like to say that yes. when we come back for the next book, anyone who yes. wants to order it, I'm happy to sign it or, or uh, right. want to have a book group, I'm happy to come if you've got a, a larger group, you know, on okay. Zoom. So happy to share the, oh. continue to share the research. Absolutely. And, um, you know, Ellen may be in the area. Right. Thank you. Um, Ellen had mentioned that she may be in the area. Um, and so we're hopefully going to be able to coordinate some time. Um, so stay tuned for that. And um, but again, thanks, everyone. And um, again, Ellen, thank you so much okay. for, for this today. All right. Okay. Take care, everyone. Bye bye. Bye.